Our scripture today is from Mark chapter 8. It's a hard one. They came from Bethsaida. Some people brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he put saliva on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, can you see anything? And the man looked up and said, I can see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on the eyes again, and he looked intently, and his sight was restored. He saw everything clearly, and he sent him away to his home, saying, Do not even go back to the village. This is the word of the Lord. You may, you may be seated. <clears throat> Will you take just a moment, let's stand and greet those. We've got a lot of folks in here today. If you'll stand and greet those around you, we've got a message for those who are online. Hey, welcome to Worship at Chapelwood. I'm so glad you're here. Some of you are with us every week online and some of you use online occasionally. We've been directing you to chapelwood.org home and that continues to be a great resource for you to communicate with us and register your attendance. But in January, we're celebrating our stewardship of gift season. And this is where we ask every member and supporter of Chapelwood to submit their estimate of giving to support the mission and the ministry of Chapelwood for 2023. I invite you to go to chapelwood.org stewardship to find out more about how you can support the mission and the ministry of Chapelwood in 2023. Y'all are so good. You're like professionals at greeting one another. That's so good. You know, I, I do want to take a moment and just in a way for us to give thanks to God. I uh, just want to let you know that Brad Gowan is here with his mom and dad, Chris and Whitney, down here with us. I don't know if you needed some extra Kleenex for that uh, video or not, Uh, but not only Brad's story, but it fits with the the message today uh, of God who is the healer. So we are in the midst of our stewardship of gift season in January, and Chapelwood, we always do it in January, where uh, a lot of you this week received uh, a nice little brochure in the mail and a stewardship card. We encourage all of our members and friends at Chapelwood to make an estimate of giving to Chapelwood for the year 2023 for the great work of mission that we do in this community. And here later in the service, you're going to get to see some of our partners that we partner with, not only through the budget of Chapelwood, but also through the disbursements of our Chapelwood Foundation. And that work just ripples out across this community and the world. And you're a part of that. You're a part of that. You know, I support a lot of other things besides Chapelwood, but I really believe that the church, uh, the body of Christ, at least biblically, is the only organization or institution on the world that God so created and named as his body and said, this is the task, this is the mission. You don't get to pick a mission or pick a focus or pick a vision. I've already given it to you. And so we have so many great partners that help us in that mission. But the church is the cornerstone and the key, at least spiritually speaking, uh, of which we sort of move out into the world. For we are the body of Christ, and Christ is the head of the body. You know, one of the things I know as we talk about our ministry partners, as we talk about Jesus the healer today, is that we live in a world where everyone is grieving. Everybody is grieving. You may say we live in a world where a lot of people are angry. A lot of people are afraid, and that's true. A lot of people are angry, a lot of people are afraid. But as a lot of really smart people will tell you who know about mental health, is that anger and fear are really manifestations of grief. That's all they are. Some of us are grieving because things are changing too fast. And some some of us are grieving because things are not changing fast enough. And a lot of us are grieving because things are out of our control. Things going on in the world around us, we don't have control over those things. 
You know, control, by the way, is an illusion. You're never really in control. But we still long for that. So, so much is disrupted around us. And we even would <clears throat> echo the psalmist. He says, why is it that the wicked continue to prosper while the good suffer? Why is it that the evil succeed but the good are left behind? You ever felt like lamenting that in recent days? I have. I was doing some research this week and I just thought, you know, we, we talk a lot here about uh, refocusing on the next generation at Chapelwood, and not only at our, our children, but resourcing our students and our young adults and our parents as we live in this world. And there's a research institute called Springtide, and they do a report each year on the state of religion of young people in 2022. And they, they revolve it around mental health and what faith leaders need to know about mental health. A lot of our partners are in ministry with young people in our community. Here's what they found. Now, this is specifically ages 13 to 25. They did over 10,000 surveys, over 100 in-depth interviews, and they actually allowed the young people, 13 to 25, to help create the surveys and to help interpret and respond because sometimes I've learned some of us older folk really don't speak young people. <laughs> and sometimes young people will tell you something and we fix it, right? We have to fix it. Uh, for them because it's not really what they mean to say. I do that with my kids when they were growing up all the time. <clears throat> and so what they found was 47% of young people reported back that they are moderately or extremely depressed. 55% moderately or extremely stressed. And 61% said the adults in my life don't truly know how much I'm struggling and typically will dismiss it. I was sharing this this week with a couple of friends who are my age, which means old. And I said, you know, man, this, this research of these young people and they're, oh, you know, they're stressed and they're depressed. And you know what every one of my friends said? Well, they just need to grow up and get over it. You know, cowboy up like we did when we were growing up. And I'm like, this is exactly what young people are saying when they share their struggles and their mental health. Some of us older folks just kind of like, hey, when I was growing up, you know, I didn't have all this stuff. I had just go outside and bare feet, march to school in the snow. I lived in South Georgia, so there was no snow. But it doesn't help the story if I don't tell you that. So these are self-reported numbers, not clinical diagnoses. But here's another thing that's interesting. For young people, when you say mental health, it doesn't carry the same stigma as it did for my generation or those older uh, than my generation. Because we used to equate mental health with mental illness. And so you hit it. You didn't talk about it. You didn't talk about things you were struggling with. You didn't talk about depression or anxiety or that kind of stuff. You, you just hit it. But for young people nowadays, when they talk about mental health, at least what we're finding, is they think of that in the same way of their physical health, of their emotional health, of their relational health. They don't see it in the same way. It's not stigmatized. We are the ones, institutions, organizations, the grown-ups, we're the ones that continue to stigmatize it and don't give our young people an opportunity to share and to be healed from this. And then they've got social media. And social media doesn't have our children's best interests in mind. I mean, a 15-year-old prefrontal cortex is no match for an industry filled with PhDs creating algorithms to steer your behavior, to, to make you think about yourself in certain ways, to steer you into a corner that makes you feel shame of, of who you are, that you don't quite measure up, that you're not quite whole. You're not as good as everyone else out there because you don't look like them or talk like them or act like them. These are not affirming messages. And sometimes we parents, we're so overwhelmed by this and we don't really know what the answer is that we just kind of give up and give them technology all they want. This makes it worse and worse. But there is some good news. 73% <clears throat> of religious young adults agreed that religion and spirituality practices positively impact their mental health. And 66% of young people say that religious or spiritual life matters for them related to their mental health. But they want to be in a place where they can be free to talk about these things and receive help about these things and know that they're loved and cared about in these things. And one of the reasons that they talked about why religion, institutional religion, and churches are not always a place that accepts them or a place they feel comfortable to work this out because they say that 
church, religion tends to stifle, be judgmental. They're mean, they're divisive and hypocritical. And that's just not healthy, not only for your spiritual life, it's not healthy for your mental life. And so they don't see a lot of organized religion in churches as a place that really wants to welcome them for who they are, for their struggles, for their insecurities, for becoming mentally healthy. Well, this is just one part of what it means when we talk about healing. It's just, it's just one, one snapshot in time. I want to quickly, uh, we have a lot going on today, but I want to quickly just unpack this passage of Scripture today and challenge us in ways that we think about how God is at work healing in our lives. This healing of the blind man in Mark chapter 8 is not just simply a miracle story. In some ways, it is a real-life enacted parable, a teaching story. Now, because I say that doesn't mean it didn't happen. It happened. But there's so much nuance and depth into this that, that it really pushes us out. Mark and Jesus, both here by Mark writing the story, Jesus living the story, helps us to notice our blindness, our inadequacy, and allows Jesus to show us what it really means to be healed and made whole, what it means to live a new life, and what it means to be on the process and the journey of healing in and of itself. Jesus is <clears throat> concerned a lot about the spiritual blindness of people. That's why there are so many healing stories of Jesus healing blind people. Because Jesus is really concerned about spiritual blindness, about how we see the world, how we see other people, how we see God. Uh, there's so many examples of this. The Gospel of John, which is uh, one of my favorite uh, books because it's just got such a great name. That's, the book is so good. Um, <laughs> it, it's so good because in John, from the beginning to the end, Light and darkness, sight and blindness directly correlate to belief and unbelief. And so John chapter 9, for example, is this long story of this man who is blind by the gate of the city and Jesus heals him and he doesn't know who Jesus is and then finally he comes to belief in Jesus and the Pharisees are mad and they bring his parents because they don't believe he was born blind and then they throw, the, they throw the young man out of the temple in the synagogue they basically excommunicate him and then at the end finally Jesus says, you know, as Pharisees, you Pharisees, you're the ones who are blind. You always have been blind. And this young man who is blind is the one who really sees. He's the one who really can see. Because he sees me, and he knows who I am, and he believes in me. And so this blindness as spiritual condition, I think, goes deeper into healing as a whole. Sometimes we think that healing is only about bodily healing, physical healing. But in our United Methodist Book of Worship, <clears throat> when we do a healing service, one of the things, you'll hear me say this all the time, is that we pray for healing of body, mind, spirit, and relationships. All of those are areas of the whole life. And sometimes we think healing is only about the body, but it's about so much more than that. And so when we think about healing, now the Holy Spirit can work to, to make us whole. <clears throat> Remember now, in the, in the New Testament Greek, the word for healing is sozo. And that word means to heal. It also means to save. And it also means to make whole, to make one. And so the word devil, diabolos, or demon, diabolos, it literally means one who divides and pulls apart. Whereas Jesus, the one who saves, is the one who makes whole and brings together, makes one. And this is why when you're trying to test the spirits of what is God and what is not God, if, if ever there's a, a division that's pulling people apart, that's usually the work of demons and the devil. And where people are struggling to come together, even in their disagreements, to be one, that's usually where you see God at work. Healing, making whole, saving. Now let me real quickly walk through this power passage of Scripture. Because while I told you John's my favorite book, this is probably one of my favorite, favorite passages of Scripture. Now I'm a preacher, so in three weeks I might say that the next passage of Scripture is my favorite passage of Scripture. I us just say I have a lot of favorite passages of Scripture. But this one is really a little more favorite than some of my favorites. This one is really good. So I'm going to do a little old school expository walk through this a little bit on this passage and point out some things that really stood out to me. They came to Bethsaida 
And some people brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. He, Jesus, took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. I learned many years ago, I had a friend, she's a, a, an African pastor uh, in uh, Kenya, and she taught, taught me this years and years and years ago about this passage of scripture. She said, John, for those of us in Africa and for those of us in Eastern cultures, like Middle East where Jesus was, a village is not just a, a spatial location. It's just not a geographical location. So if I put in my GPS, Google Maps or Apple Maps, uh, Apple Maps I want to drive to College Station, there's a dot there, right? And I drive to the dot and I know once I cross whatever the city line, county line, it says entering College Station. It's a place, it's a place, it occupies geographical boundary. That's not the way in African culture they define and understand village. It has an identity. Yes, it's the buildings. Yes, it's the city. Yes, it's the geography. But it's more than that. It's the people. It's their mindset. It's the way they operate. It's their culture. It's their norms. It's their identification. So what Jesus does, when they bring, he comes to Bethsaida, they came to Bethsaida, they're there in the village, they come to the village, and they bring the blind man to him who lives in the village, and he says to him, come on, let's go with me, we got to go for a walk. <clears throat> he takes him out of the village, out of the village. You know, the village was the place that defined him. You're blind. You're really worthless. You don't contribute. You sit there every day and we walk by you. You'll never have a job that'll contribute to the betterment of the whole. You'll never get married. You'll never have children. You'll never really be a whole part of our community. You'll always be a drag and a drain. That's just who you are. It's who you've always been. Jesus takes him out of that. Because you see, you can't be healed wholly when you're stuck in the village. When you're stuck and enslaved in a place where you are predefined. That limits healing. And when he had put saliva on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, can you see anything? And the man looked up and said, I can see people, but they look like trees walking. A lot of people are really bothered by this passage. Because it takes Jesus two tries. It's almost like, you know, was there some kryptonite nearby? And maybe Jesus, like, didn't have all his superpowers. I mean, is, was somebody draining power from him? I mean, what's the deal? Because in most other healing stories, it only takes one touch or a word and the person is healed. When we think about this from a larger perspective, it makes sense. And I think it makes sense on two, on two fronts. One... Healing is a process. It's a journey. Brad's still on it. Will be for a long time. All of us are. All of us, sometimes you just can't see the healing journey. I've been on a healing journey. I think my whole life I've been on a healing journey. We're in the process of being healed, and it takes time. I talked to several people who came out of the early service this morning, how they had been through some health issues lately and some things that surgeries or things that didn't go exactly like they thought and they got a little delayed or they had a little bit longer in the hospital or maybe they got derailed or maybe something went exactly not, not like it was supposed to and sort of they came back around and they found this healing and they connected so deeply with that because it is a process. It's a process that we have to participate in and that's the second point. The second part is Jesus is not limited at all. Jesus is not limited, but we can be limited. And we can create boundaries and barriers that keep the healing of Jesus from working fully. I physically, I went last week, got my annual physical. Doc says, you know, John, cholesterol is a little high. You probably change your diet. We've got you on this med, but it's looking good. And you've gained some weight since last year. I said, thank you very much for noticing that appreciate it and you can't cheat anymore because now it's like the little bed you sit on weighs you 
So like I can't kind of like hold on to the wall or something like that. I mean, <clears throat> you know, I mean, I could participate in my wellness or I cannot participate in my wellness. And so all of that is a part of, am I participating in the healing? Am I willing to give myself and participate to healing and wholeness in my life? For many years, I've talked about this before, you know, my father had had affairs and left when I was 14, our family, and and I held on to a lot of hatred and animosity, but it kind of defined me. The brokenness was my story. Sometimes that brokenness is our story. Things go wrong in our life. And you know why? It's somebody else's fault. It's a part of my broken history. So it's not entirely on me. That limits my own healing. I'm in the way. And whenever you're in the way of your own healing, whenever you stand in the way and you refuse to be fully open to whatever God leads you in some new direction of healing, of body, mind, spirit, and relationship, and it changes the way you see the world. It does. My unwillingness to participate in God's healing in my life through anger and, and unforgiveness changed the way that I saw God, changed the way that I saw people, changed the way that I saw myself. Like people were like trees walking around. They weren't human. They were objects. Think about the people that you disagree with. In the world, we're going through this grief, we're angry, we're frustrated, we're afraid. And so we get sideways with people, we get divided with people. Part of that has to be expunged out of the spirit, has to be healed. And yet we don't want to participate in that because that means we got to give some things up. That means we have to see our enemy as someone to love and pray for. We don't always want to do that. So people are like trees. They're dehumanized and objectified. They're not real people. They're not children of God. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he looked intently, and his sight was restored. And he saw everything clearly. And then he sent him away to his home, saying, do not even go into the village. Listen to this. Then he sent him away to his home, saying, do not even go into the village. This is my favorite part of this passage, one of the reasons why this passage is my favorite, and yet it is the hardest part of the passage. Jesus heals him. He is completely set free. He can see now. He, not only the process has worked, the time has worked, but he's gotten out of the way and he's participated in it. He's willing to allow himself to be free. And then Jesus said, I want you to go home, but I do not want you to go back into the village. Where does he live? Where does he live? He lives in the village. I want you to go home, but I don't want you to go back to the village. And my friend, Gracie and Matthew, taught me, I want you to go home, but you do not go back to the way that you were defined by the village. You are no longer the blind man who sits on the side of the road. You are no longer the man who's worthless. You're no longer the man who can't contribute. You're no longer the man who may never get married and may never have kids and all that kind of... No, that's not you anymore. That's been you your whole life. That's not you anymore. So I want you to go home. But I don't want you to go back to that. I don't want you to go back into that defined, formerly defined identity because you are no longer that person. And it happens for all of us. It happened for me in my life. When you're no longer defined by those little things, you have to be defined by something different. You know, I, I think of Brad, you know, in your life, if, if you're only constrained to say everything's got to be back exactly the way it was before the accident, that's a limitation. But he knows it. I talked to him. He knows there's a new future ahead of him. And as Chris said, God's going to be glorified in that new future. And and the thing about Brad is he's willing to live into that wherever that journey takes him, whatever it looks like. That's true for all of us, not just in the physical body, but in the mental health, in the relationships. That's really key. Don't, Don't just think about your physical health. Think about your relationships. Think about relationships as we Christians have with one another. We live in a day where Christians don't, don't even like Christians anymore. Christians hate Christians. And I'm thinking, man, you talk about needing to get out of the village, <laughs> needing some healing. 
We all need it. But it starts with Jesus saying, you're going to have to leave that, those predefined character, categories. You're going to have to leave behind all that brokenness that you hold on to that's defined you. You're going to have to come with me out of the village. Because first step, I'm not going to really be able to do much unless you come out of that. And even then, it's going to be a process. You're going to have to work on it. It's going to take some time. And there'll be some setbacks. You won't be perfect. But you also have to participate with me. You have to be willing. You have to be willing to be healed. Jesus asked the guy who was by the pool of Siloam one time, the, the paralytic on the mat. And the guy said, you know, heal me, Jesus. He's like, do you want to be healed? I'm like, well, that's a horrible question to ask a guy who's a paralytic on a mat. Do you want to be healed? But it's a great question Jesus asked. Do you really want to be healed or is your identity so set on being the paralytic by the pool that gets the sympathy and gets the donations and get everything that, that your life, that, that you can't think about living in a different way? I think that's the question we all have to ask or Jesus has to ask all of us. Do you want to be healed? So, if you do, if you do, then you're going to have to let Jesus work. And when he sends you home, you don't need to go back to the village. Let's pray. Lord, I pray this passage of Scripture will open in our hearts and our minds new ways of seeing how you are at work in us healing and making whole. Lord, not just in the physical body, that's a huge part of it, but in our minds, our spirits, and relationships as well. Lord, make us whole in you. Make us uh, the kinds of followers of Christ who participate in this journey of healing. Because, God, you will always be there for us and always be there to heal us. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.